as we do Charles Duma in London. Let's go to Mr. Duma, who's been way out front on continuing EU angst. Charles, what did you learn, stressful or non stressful, about these stress tests? Nothing very much, really, I'm afraid. The, um, the problem is that the stress tests are talking about the balance sheets as presented now, and they push, push them through some adjustments. But um, what they're not allowing for is to take the obvious case of Spain, which is the kind of swing state in all this crisis, um, is that the Spanish um, debt ratios in business uh, are about the same as Japan's in 1996. And, of course, in the Japanese case, the... Um, Banks didn't really fess up to the losses yeah. that they were making until um, March 2003, which was about six or seven years later. So, um, you know, people can hang on, and I think at this stage that's what they're doing. They're, it's a mixture of bluff and denial over there. Let's look at this chart, folks. It is an elegant chart, and I think it pictures the banking here. We'll talk economics with Mr. Duma here in a bit. The transatlantic difference. Okay, we rigged it. Okay, unit credit is the white line. They're in big, big trouble in Italy. The yellow line is Deutsche Bank doing better than unit credit. And that blue line is the success of Fortress Diamond. This is banking performance in the equity markets uh, normalized back five years. Charles Duma, has there been a difference in this four year financial crisis between the way we've done it in the United States and the way they've done it in Europe? What is that distinction? Well, I think that the, the, the um, bad news in terms of balance sheets has largely been absorbed in the United States because, of course, the crisis originated there with the subprime crisis. And uh, the result is that uh, U.S. banks were obliged to <coughs> take their write-downs pretty much immediately. And the consequential write-downs of all these um, derivative securities like CDOs and so on and so forth. Um, the bad news now... Um, uh, lies mostly um, in, in, in the immediate sense in government debt with Greece and to some extent Italy, but it also lies in business debt in uh, Portugal and um, Spain and with household debt in Ireland. Right. And in all of those cases, there's no crisis yet. Well, I think that's a nice nuance of it. As you prepare for next week, Charles, what are you thinking about, about this cacophony in Europe? What are you focusing on in your discussion with Lombard Street Research clients? Well, the main point here is that um, everything that they propose to deal with the problem, and the immediate problem, of course, is Greece, um, has a drawback. And because it has a drawback, it tends to get um, rejected. Uh, the difficulty is that uh, the current situation has a much bigger drawback, namely that they're going off the edge of a cliff quite soon. Uh, but uh, since each particular solution gets rejected because it has a drawback, there is nothing done. So what we're really looking at is European governance, which is not capable of running a mm. major currency. They, they don't have the apparatus in place for making and implementing the decisions they need to make if they're going to have a major currency. So the Greeks ultimately will have to go and ultimately could be quite soon. Do you agree with Professor Feldstein of Harvard that there will be a breakup that Europe will, that Greece rather, will leave whatever communities left over? I, I certainly think that Greece um, is so far, far more likely to, to leave than not. Uh, and I suspect that Portugal will have to go. Um, the Irish are competitive inside the euro, so they may be able to hang on, but will probably have to default. The swing case, as I said before, is Spain, uh, where right. they might be able to hang on. But the problem with Spain hanging on is that uh, on a good forecast, they have no growth for the next eight to ten years. On a bad forecast, they have a depression if they hang on. Let's bring up the op-ed here, Charles of Alarian writing uh, in the FT today. Um, radical options. The Prime Minister is right. It is crunch time. Europe at a fateful juncture. Uh, the longer officials dither, that's the word of the week, dither, the smaller the scope for catching up with a spreading crisis. That's the immediacy, Charles, that you have talked about really for, for pushing on two years. Exactly how are we going to stop dithering? What is the leadership mechanism that needs to be invented in Europe? Well, you see, you're asking the wrong person that question, because as far as I'm concerned, the euro is extremely damaging even to Germany, let alone all these countries that are in trouble. So the best thing that can happen is if it breaks up. The problem is that um, because of the sort of extraordinary devotion to it that all these political leaders have, 
you can only break up because of their failure and so it's bound to be a disorderly breakup and that is the nature of the crisis we're facing. We've seen little market move. What will you look at in the early European morning on Monday? Do you look at the Spanish-German spread? Do you look at credit default swaps? Do we see Euro-Swiss go to new Swiss strength? What indicators will you watch? I don't think it's really the market sort of responds to specific pieces of news and there's no special news which is, is going to cause the trouble. The um, thing that will make all the difference is when they finally decide whether or not the Germans are going to spend the money necessary to bail Greece out and on what conditions and exactly when that decision will be made is, is nothing to do with the market. The market will simply respond to that. Um, and, you know, Mrs. Merkel is at the moment trying to slow things down because she doesn't see why they should rush to a decision. But unfortunately, because um, the, everyone is now so sort of sensitized to all of this, uh, she may not be able to dictate the schedule. So, um, you know, the, they, they're basically they're backing into it and um, it, it's going to be right. a disorderly breakup. First time I've ever asked this question, and let me ask it of you with your years of experience of ECB watching, even pre-ECB. Will there be a difference between Truchet and Draghi? Will there be a new ECB? Um, I shouldn't think so, no. I think the ECB has already essentially sold itself down the river. I mean, the ECB is put a whole lot of red lines down and then allowed itself to be forced over them time after time. Um, the ECB was founded on the principle that there would be no um, in company, country bailouts within the euro and that countries would be left on their own. Well, you know, first of all, they dropped that principle a year ago and then they started to accept all kinds of junk bonds. And just in the last two or three weeks, we've had the ECB deciding that even if um, Moody's or someone downgrades one of these countries to junk, nevertheless, they'll carry right. on accepting their bonds. So, so they've had it. Now, let's get philosophical on a Friday here with Charles Dumas. Here's a chart. We want to show it to the governor from Colorado here in a bit. America observes a corporate juggernaut. And this, of course, is inflation-adjusted corporate profits, that sense of gilded age, some would say a corporate plutocracy in the United States. Charles Dumas, with your travels and contacts in Europe, is the same corporate profit juggernaut visible in non-peripheral Europe? Yes, I think the profits are extremely good in Germany because, of course, the flip side of um, Club Med being heavily overvalued is that Germany is undervalued. They, they've engaged in competitive devaluation through the mechanism of zero wage increases for the last 10 years. The result is that uh, corporate profits are very strong indeed. Uh, let's bring up the op-ed here from John Taylor, Professor Taylor of Stanford. See this, folks, at Bloomberg View. Uh, and this, of course, speaking on American politics. There it is, a two-step approach to solving the United States budget impasse. Let's pretend we're in the United Kingdom or we're in Germany. Proposals can be debated openly for a course of a year. No more closed-door meetings followed by media leaks of what was said. Charles Dumas, there seems to be almost a difference in process that I've observed in the United Kingdom versus the United States. Do you observe a difference in method here in this financial crisis where we're behind closed doors and it's a more open rhetoric in the United Kingdom? I, I think your, your um, professor friend there has a slightly idealized view about what goes on in Europe. <laughs> um, certainly, I mean, the, the system in Britain has been described as a sort of democratic um, dictatorship. Uh, the, the government has a majority in the parliament and um, in general when the government reaches a view about something the majority supports it and that's that. You don't have this um, in some ways much more democratic system in the US where you have this sort of um, balance of power um, between the Congress on the one hand, the President on the other, the, the Senate and the, the House within the Congress and so on and so forth. So. I would say that our discussions here are no more open than yours are, and actually I think your discussions are pretty open. It's just that there are a bunch of guys out there with a very strong position in the Congress who uh, don't want to do a deal on the debt ceiling. And what did you think about the debt ceiling? I don't know if you observed the president's press conference here uh, earlier, but Charles Dumas, you look at uh, the debate here, and certainly in my travels I've seen the international angst over our U.S. discussion. Is that the same debate as a few years ago? Or, or do you see something different this time as you observe from London what goes on in Washington? 
Well, I, I had the sense that the um, level of underlying anxiety in America is more intense than it has been in the past, and that um, that's expressing itself in this very intransigent and divisive politics that you have, uh, with a sort of 50% on each side of, between the parties and these extremely aggressive and outspoken Tea Party people who are nevertheless um, pointing out the very obvious reality, namely that the US oughtn't to want to run its um, public debt ratio up a whole lot more than it is already. So um, there, there's a reasonable point behind it. And the difficulty is that um, all the solutions are painful, and so the debate is bound to be painful too. Charles, would you be in the stock market in Europe? Would you be investing in non-peripheral Europe? You mentioned earlier the corporate profits. David Kotak in the United States suggests that's a place to be. Do you agree? Uh, no, I don't, because I think that um, the uh, China is slowing down, slowing down fast. The United States will slow down next year under the impact of um, very sharp budgetary deflation. Uh, and then the only source of growth in Europe, which is German exports, um, will disappear. And at that stage, the German consumers does absolutely nothing. And um, the, the deflation in the peripheral countries, and in particular the whole of Club Med, not to mention Britain right. and some degree France and Germany too, that's going to drag us all down. Very good. Charles Dumas, thank you so much. Just perfect to have Mr. Dumas on uh, this day of the stress tests in Europe.